Truth is I'm tired Options are few I'm trying to pray But where are you? I'm all churched out Hurt and abused I can't fake what's left to do Come on. Truth is I'm Amen. Okay, um, for those who want to watch online, you can text and let them know that they are up on YouTube now. So if they want to um, tune in to see what's going on, I'm just going to pause for a second and give you the opportunity to text your family members and loved ones and let them know that it's up and running. the musical tribute this time it's going to be on the steel pan um, and we pray that it will bless your heart just want to extend some words to the family that the peace of God, I pray that the peace of God that transcends all understanding would guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Just know that mom, although she is gone, she will not be forgotten. She lives on in our hearts and we have the ability to carry on the legacy of Leah Francis. And I know that is what she would want so we have to live in such a way that we will see her again. Anytime someone transition over, your goal is to see them again. And the only way that can happen is we have to live a life that will cause us to transition to the same place that she is. Because where she is, there's no sorrow, there's no crying, there's no more sickness, nothing. You know, she is happy. I know right now both her and her and dad probably sitting by the rivers and the banks of Jordan just enjoying the moment and saying, come on, sons, come on, we can do this. We can do it. So we want to encourage you, family, at this time to take comfort knowing that she is with the father.
Beautiful rendition. Some glad morning when this life is all, I'll fly away. That morning came for mom, and she is with the father. At this time, we are going to take some time to do some reflections. So there is a mic right here, and I'm going to give you two minutes for those at large in the, in the audience before we call on the family member, those that are listed in the program. But at large, we are opening the mic at this time. And if you want to just give a thought, a word, um, a reflection of who Leah Francis was, her life, her impact, her legacy, her imprint, right? Okay, so for those who are at large and have something to say, please line up at the side over here so we would know how many people are coming up to say something because we have a cutoff time. Um, we have a cutoff time and we want to give everybody an opportunity. We don't want anyone to think that we left them out of the program. So this is when we are opening it up for you to give your words of encouragement to the family. And please, um, don't delay the process. Thank you. Good morning. I took my opportunity to rush over here. On behalf of the Mount Olivet Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Deaconess Ministries, we just want to say a few words. If my ladies that are over there would please stand. As you see, we're kind of short on numbers, but we have a, like two rows of deaconess that are here. But today it's just our faithful few that are here, but we would not be remiss not to be able to come up and say a few words about one of our members. At this time, she was an honorary member because she had paid her dues. And so I just wanna state for the record and uh, Psalms 27 verse 13 through 14 it says I remain confident for this of this I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living so to the family wait on the Lord be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord charity starts at home family am I right she was a godly woman, wife, mother, nurse, deaconess, and a servant for the Lord. We are so very grateful for her life and the example she has led. A light has diminished, but her legacy lives on, family. To leave a poem with you, I would like to say, don't give up. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, and debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sign. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Continue on and live her legacy, family. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Good morning and blessings to each and every one of you as we come today to celebrate this awesome gift of life we were graced with. Leah Blair Francis was a gem and in her life she left a legacy that I'm watching before me. Each of you now, you continue to carry her light the force and the energy and the spirit in which she loved and lived and graced this planet lives with each and every one of us who have had the honor to experience her joy, her light, her love, her grace, and her beauty. She was such a light bulb 
a light bulb of energy and her spirit radiated to anyone who came in contact with her. And I had the honor and privilege to get to be in her presence just a few moments in time as I got to see her son and her children care for her and honor her in how they made sure that her days were treated with grace, with honor, with dignity, and with love. We cherish her and we celebrate today because this light, this gift that God has given us has now gone to be with the Father. And she's celebrating and rejoicing and she's looking on down on us today and she's saying, lift your head up. Stand tall and strong. Laugh and smile because I am in glory and my presence and my essence lives with you. So let your light shine so brightly that the pillars of her energy rest and reigns and moves throughout the earth through each and every one of us. I'm Arlene Connolly Drummond, a friend and a love to the family and to my dear friend, Mark Francis, I am so honored for how I saw how you cared and took care of your mom. You gave an example for so many of us of what it means to love and care for our loved ones to the end. I give you all peace and I wish you all continued grace and blessings. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Sister Rosalind Murray, and I know in the program it has been mentioned that uh, outlined that someone would speak as a nurse. But I just can't let this opportunity pass that she's not mentioned as she was the health leader in this church for several years. And there are some of those here who were on that team and worked very diligently with Sister uh, uh, Francis. Uh, it, it even got to the point that there was others in other churches that would come and join along with us. And so with her being in the health ministry, she brought many uh, uh, health emphasis uh, times that we as individuals, females and males, should um, take care of our bodies and the things that we should do. She had that infectious smile and she was so loving and so accommodating. And so not only that I worked with her here at my Olivet, but I was a nurse at Holy Cross for almost 23 years. And on the night shift, she worked 11, I worked at that time before 12 hours, uh, it was 11 to seven. And she was in the pool and she would come sometimes and work with us on the surgical floor. I could see her right now walking down Four South Isles, uh, hallway and ministering her care to her patients. So loving, and as it all goes, it comes a time when you pass that baton on and you retire because you've done your work, and so it has been with me. But I just could not sit and not say something about the ministry that she had done here at Mount Olivet. We know that Sister Francis is sleeping now, and when the trump of God will sound, she will come forth, and she will be, as all of us are looking forward to, going to be with our Lord, Savior Jesus Christ. And to the family, I comfort all of you with these words. Okay. While, while we, um, this would be the last two that we will be hearing from because I did time it for just about 10 minutes and we are right upon that brink of the time. Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Wesley Powell and I'm representing Bart in the community. Uh, I didn't really know Miss Leah, but I knew his, her son, which is Mark. Mark and I worked together back in the day at Mark and in the community. And I want you all to know something. Your children is the reflection of you. And a lot of you all look down on your kids that they're not walking in the path, but then you're looking down on yourselves. However, Mark, I want to say, is the most distinguished man, intelligent, loving, and caring man that I know, he is very, give him a hand. 
He is very selfless. He, him and I have a lot in common because I'm a caregiver of my mom. I retire to take care of my mom. And Mark is, was taking care of his mother and we have a lot in common. Because you all don't know to take care of your parent, you become the parent. But we have given up a lot to care for our parent. And you know, he's just so loving. And, and I just thank God for him. And I'm asking God to give him strength. And I just want you all to know that that's, a, that's just a marvelous thing that you can do to give back to your parent who, give, who gave so much to you. So, you know, just in this hour of time, y'all continue to pray for the family, but you put your arms around Mark because it's a hard task to let them go. But I, you know, we know that God will give him the strength. And we thank Mark for all his services that he did in the community, and he did it well. Thank you. Oh Lord, your many blessings. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good. He is good and His mercy endureth forever. I had to say something on behalf of my family, the great family. We love you. We will never be forgotten. Friends, forever. Thank the Lord for you and all you have done in the community in the church, in everything, everywhere you've gone, everything you've done, you've done well. And we thank you for it. And God will bless you and the support that you have given family, those who are here, those who are not here. We have loved ones who have gone on. And we're still praying for the families as well. Thank you. Continue to do what you're doing. Regretfully, I wasn't in the nurse care field, which I should have been, and I did regret <laughs> in later years when you have family members that are coming along, children or whatever, you know, little things, you know, that your parents did right then. They don't do now, especially all the certain things, you know, that, that are being done outside of the pills and things like that, you know, the health things. But we're grateful and thankful to all of those who have been in the health care field. We're grateful for Brother Francis, who's still on my heart. We thank him for all the things that he did, where he worked, and all of that, too. And there are those who sent their greetings. I have a classmate in California, Margaret Larkins, who was one of uh, the persons he worked with in, in uh, Miami. But anyway, God loves you, and we love you. And we just want to say something to you, too. On behalf of the great family, I'm Juanita Gray. There are others who are not with us in their family. John L. Gray, you all know him, so if you remember him. And Jerome Edmund Gray. We have a lawmaker in the family and a lawbreaker in the family, Jeffrey Gray, but we ask the Lord to bless and keep them as well, too. And we thank all of you for what you have done. Continue what you're doing. God is good and God is love. And we love you, family. You know we love you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Right on target where we need to be. Um, at this time, I'm going to call on Elder Noel Sterling to give some words of encouragement at this time. I came into Mount Olivet Doors 40 plus years ago, and I came into, when I came to those doors, I remember uh, this short man and his wife came and they greeted me. And I'll never forget, I looked at him and he said, why do you look at me like that? And I said, like what? <laughs> he said, you think you're taller than I am? <laughs> well, uh, uh, some of you don't know, but he was a man of a different stature than it is with uh, Mark and Paul, but he was a man, loved his family. His wife and himself, I noticed in there, it, there's a slot for Sabbath school, 
they worked together in unison. Uh, I remember I used to sit in his class back there and uh, both of them, Sister Frances normally sit in the back and she, I noticed one Sabbath she went like this and I didn't say anything. Uh, but there was another Sabbath that rolled around and I noticed that she did like this and the superintendent was standing up here somewhere and she went like this again. So after the service, I, I went to her and I said, Sister Frances, why did you do that? She said, that's a sign to quit. <laughs> and so um, they work together hand in hand. But transitioning from, they came down from New York. They were here seven years, I think, before I did. Um, and I remember when they came down, coming from New York City to Fort Lauderdale, it's, it, it's, it's a change because the transportation system is different totally down here. You need a transportation. Um, Sister Frances did not drive. She was a unique lady, very obedient to her husband. And I remember she said, Sterling, I want to drive. And I said, I don't blame you. It's hard to get around. And so she uh, drum up the idea. And, and uh, I don't know who did, if it's Paul or Mark or Dad or who it was. But uh, she got her driver's license. She bought a car. One Sabbath morning, she was coming to church, and, and, and we back there waiting, and but Francis would not come. And then we found out there was an accident at 27th and Sunrise. Uh, Sister Francis had just gotten a car, and she wanted to drive to church. Sister Francis. They both agreed they would drive two separate cars and they got to 27th. It was a little bit uh, raining a little bit. And so uh, they got to 27th, the light red, uh, got to red. But Francis stopped and Sister Francis, ooh, <laughs> and he, she nailed him. Uh, wasn't anything much, but um, so after everything was over, you know, I stopped by the house one night and I said, uh, what really took place over there? And he, he started laughing. Uh, and she said, tell him. So um, Brother Francis said, I'll tell you this much. I hit the brakes and I knew it would have happened. But when the cops got there, the cops took one driver's license and registration and he went to the other car and he took a driver's license and registration and, and, and he came back, he said, he came back to me and he, he said he looked like my, one of my sons. And the, the cop said, sir, do you know that lady back there? <laughs> And he said, that's my wife. He said, Dad, listen, go home. Call your insurance company. <laughs> but listen, sometimes you look back at life and you have to smile at the past. Um, Brother Francis, Sister Francis, as mentioned, she was a registered nurse. She was one who would do anything for you. Um, she, we got so close that she started to call me son. And then when my son was born, he said, she said to me, she said, you know, that's my boyfriend. And, um, right until, you know, she really got sick. That was her boyfriend. Um. Mark, 
Paul, Philip, great guys. I applaud them. Somebody mentioned that they take care of their mother. I know it was tough on Philip to be here because when you're in a different state, it's something else. You can't just run every day. But I know his mind was there with mom. But Paul, in a condition that he is, um, you did a tremendous job. Mark, God bless you. I would say something else, but I'm not permitted. Um, but God bless you for what you did for your mom. Um, it's always good to remember mother. 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 Great woman. Fearing God. And she passes on the legacy. And I know that she one day when the trumpet of God shall sound, it is my belief that she's going to wake up and she will say, this is my God. I've waited for him. But he wants to see her son, our sons and our grandsons and all of our grandchildren again. God bless you as we live together until Jesus comes. Thank you so much. We're going to call now on the Mackenzie family, the niece, that they will come and say something. you to try to use the mic because there are those online who need to hear your voice. Thank you. sadness as we gathered here today to say goodbye to my aunt. She was a very loving aunt and um, I remember her fondly. Um, could you all hear me? Yeah, my fondest memories of her was when my grandmother was sick and me and my sisters went to care for her in Orlando um, to give Aunt Wilda a respite and so we used to sit at night, she loved Chinese checkers. And so we would play in the wee hours of the night um, with the Chinese checkers and um, you had to have your A game on because when, <laughs> when, um, when she's winning or when she's losing or whatever the case may be, she would be like, um, could we play again? Could we play another turn? But the funniest part of it, one night we stayed so late playing the game when we went to check on, um, you know, to get Granny ready for the next day, we almost threw Granny down because we were so tired and sleepy from playing the night before. But, um, you know, we got our composure and we did what we had to do. Um, I have great respect for my aunt and I love her a lot. And the reason why I'm saying so, because I remember when my father died, she traveled with mom. She traveled all the way to Caracol, West Indies, to, to support her younger sister, my mother. And she was always there, no matter what, to support the family. And um, she, um, she gave her undying support. She, she used to call me Lozy. I 
don't know where the L came from. She used to always say Lozy, my Lozy. When we FaceTime, she would say Lozy. Uncle Frank calls me Rosie, but she calls me Lozy. And so I it's 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 very difficult for me to talk about her because as the years go by, um, her memory failed her. And so um I remember I remembered fondly when Uncle Thomas passed away. She came to New York, and that's when I really saw a decline in her memory. Um, as evidence of when we went to the church, we came out and they was giving out the programs. And um, Aunt Lee had had two programs, and um, she said, she said to me, um, "Can I get a program?" And this time she had two sitting on her lap. So I said. And Leah, you already have a program. She goes, honestly, I didn't get any program. And so um, later on that day, they were giving out um, like tins of green beans, you know, the church. And um, somebody brought two tins for me. And, and Leah said, can I have one? So I gave her the two tins of green beans. And um, the, the person that was given, you know, they said, okay, I'll go back and get you two. So when they came back with the two, and Leah said, can I have the green beans? And I said, but you have to already. And she looked at me, honestly, I didn't get any yet. You know, so it was really funny, but it was kind of bittersweet because then I saw how she was declining. And so it really broke my heart, but I had to, you know, up to this day, me and my friend Kathleen, we always use that word, honestly, we did, you know, so as Aunt Leah would say. But, you know, I just want to say, um, we're here to represent, you know, the Mackenzie family and I'm going to miss her because um, she was very kind, she was very loving. Her lookalike, which is my mother, they're so, I mean, she resembled my mother so much, but it was so different, you know? She was the gentler side, as Debbie said to mommy. Mommy would say, could you go to the store? And No, Aunt Leah would say, could you go to the store and bring me such and such? Mommy would say, go to the store, go to wherever, wherever, and bring it back to me. So mommy would make sure she get what she has to get when Aunt Leah would be humbly like, you know, just the softer side, you know, but um, she was just loving and kind and I just want to say um, she would be greatly missed. I would miss FaceTime and her and thank you all for coming and may she rest in peace. Okay, we're going to call on her grandkids at this time. Lamont and Michelle to come on up. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, if we could get the music just lowered a little bit. I want to make sure I'm heard for the family listening afar, okay? Thank you. All right. Uh, today's a bit bittersweet occasion to say the least for me, but also a celebration of life for my grandma, Leah Blair Francis. Many of you may have had a similar experience as I did growing up, spending time with your grandparents, while your parents were away or working. But I lived with my grandparents, and I can't forget my late Aunt Millie, also known as Mildred Blair. Growing up with my grandparents was the sweetest experience because my joy was their joy. And as a kid, I got away with a lot living with them. My grandma and my Aunt Millie's words of wisdom from a very early age and also being raised as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church truly grounded me throughout my adulthood and impacted me in such a way that it is a reflection of the young lady that I am today. The impact of their words really kept me on a straight and narrow path, especially when I was away from home in college trying to figure out life on my own. Unfortunately, I lived through some moments as a child witnessing the results of how bad decisions and actions of relatives negatively affected some of my family members, and I knew I never wanted that for myself. Because of their wise words, I could look temptations and peer pressure in the face and confidently say, no thank you. 
I like to share some examples of how she reared me as a child, which still lives true to my lifestyle today. Because of grandma, I am what many may call an early bird. Grandma would wake me up early before the sun rises to get an early start on the day. We would first make worship and read the Sabbath school lesson before we would get up and go exercising, walking around the block in our neighborhood. As a nurse, grandma maintained a healthy lifestyle and diet. The first exercise I ever learned was how to do the bicycle, which she taught me. Grandma was a vegetarian and introduced me to many different protein options and substitutes for meat. Grandma loved to juice fruits and vegetables, and I do too. One of her favorite juices she would make was carrot juice. I remember the days she would pick aloe leaves from our backyard and have me eat it because she said it was healthy. I hated it, but again, it stuck, just like many other things she taught me. And today, I have aloe leaves in my house regularly. To conclude, the greatest gift Grandma ever gave me was teaching me how to know and love God. And that it is my responsibility to tell and share with others about him. I'll miss her no longer being here to welcome and close the Sabbath, sitting in a circle, singing spiritual hymns with my family. Because of Grandma, I've had many milestones in this church with our church family. I was baptized here by Pastor McNeely. I recited Bible memory verses every 13th Sabbath that she drilled me to remember. I sang in the children's choir directed by Sister Young and later Miss Claudette. My grandparents took us to camp meetings over the summers in Hawthorne, Florida. I witnessed what it was like to go in the neighborhood of this community and speak to souls that didn't even know God is real. I witnessed her leading blood bank drives and being a pathfinder with my grandpa. Grandma, you are the blueprint and my guiding light. And I know that these past eight months were very challenging for you, but yet you still smiled and, give me, and gave me as many kisses as I wanted. I know that you know that I did my best for you and that I was by your side daily feeding you, taking care of you, encouraging you to stay strong and advocating for your health when I saw professional healthcare workers fall short of that and had counted you out. Grandma, you had a blessed 98 years here, and some may say you were on borrowed time since your last injury, but I know it was only by God's grace that you made it this far, and when he called you to rest, that it was his divine timing for you to be where you are today, resting peacefully until Jesus comes again. God bless everyone, and thank you, church family for being there for my grandma all those years, past my grandfather's passing. My grandma did not drive, like mentioned earlier, but individuals like Sister Juanita Gray, Sister Vita Gray, uh, Sister Hazel, Sister Ann Preddy, Sister McKnight, Sister McFarlane, wait, correction, Auntie Sheila. <laughs> um, Brother and Sister Marsh. I mean, and there's so many more. Um, you guys were everything to us. Um, getting us to church and back, along with Aunt Millie. Um, and I'm forever grateful. Thank you. And I just want to uh, make some clarity. My grandmother is from a small Dutch island. It's pronounced St. Eustatius. Is that right? OK. All right, I try. <laughs> And also, um, I know it may be warming to the hearts of family and friends, but I know my grandma would be proud for me to let you know that she is resting in peace. She hasn't ascended anywhere. She's resting in peace until Jesus comes back, okay? So thank you guys all for your kind words. All right, Lamont, you got it. Good morning, family. Some of my earliest memories was of her and Aunt Millie picking me up from the airport. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., um, but, you know, Grandma was always there with me, whether it was 
if I was present with her or just in spirit or just calling me, you know, I had such a, you know, she had such a way of just talking and I can't even do that sometimes. It's just, you know. Yeah, so um, I enjoyed both the love I got from both Aunt Millie and my grandmother. But once my sisters came around, Aunt Millie was done with me. So <laughs> I, I can only go with Grandma at that point. Um, I used to sleep in Aunt Millie's bed, but then they took over, so now I'm sleeping in Grandma's bed. But those are some magical moments for me because if you know one thing about Grandma, she was a great storyteller. Like some of you guys in here, like her uh, nieces and nephews, but you know she talked about your folks like they were legendary. Like, and I would I would meet them, and it was like exactly how she described them, you know what I mean? So uh, not only just that, but just her way with words of just explaining how she would, you know, how to, you know, explaining different stories in the Bible. Um, and you, you had to really use your imagination with Grandma because she was that vivid with, with how she explained and how she expounded on things. Um, me being from a, a city environment, uh, then coming to Lauder Hill, you know, things would get boring quick for me. Um, <laughs> Grandma would ask, Grandma would, but Grandma would set tasks with me. Um, you know, I had a, a godmother back home that was always stern on making sure I was doing what I was supposed to be doing because she knew I was, you know, I can get away with murder sometimes. <laughs> but Grandma stayed on top of me. I get, I get here, she'll have quarterly set up for me to read. She'll have, uh, you know, if you've been in my grandfather's uh, garage at the time, it was like a library. So every book in there, she had me reading a book like every, every day. You know, so it was just, it was a different environment. It was just, but I, I respected it because I knew it was, you know, she was very humble and came from the heart when she showed her unconditional love towards me. Something that I wasn't too used to as a child. Um, you know, grandma would take me to the swap shop. She, <laughs> She cried when she put me on the Ferris wheel and uh, it'll stop and she's thinking I'm going to fall or something. <laughs> she was very loving and very concerned and cautious about, you know, the kids and her family. And I'd get sick all the time when I was down here, whether it was chicken pox or anything. And grandma would quarantine the, the whole section of the house and treat me like a little king. And I was like, I love this. <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't, um, I, I can't even fathom anyone as, as great as she was, you know, and the way that she treated me, I didn't, you know, I, I, and at that age, I just didn't understand a person like that, you know. You know, Grandma had a way with her simplicity that a lot of us kind of struggle with, you know. Grandma would, you know, she would always preach not being so worldly, you know, and for me, you know, and a lot of people, we struggle with those temptations, but for her, it was like that. So I think that's what, you know, she's always instilled in me and what I still to this day um, try to strengthen and bring and, and build myself up to be as more simple in my, you know, to make my life as simple as possible. Um, what else we got here? Her most important task was instilling Adventism, building re a relationship with God, working on me understanding my salvation with the Lord, whether I was in her presence, like I said, or if I was away. Um, kind of touched all of these. You hear how Jesus came to be um, the example of following God's word and to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Then you start to look for people in your life that, em, that emulate that best. Uh, grandma was that for me, um, at least the first. Um, and a lot of her siblings, you know, they were like that too. Um, I give all the praise also to my Aunt Wilden, who did a lot of work um, with, you know, taking care of her mother, both of them. I will see Mama come back and forth to both of their houses. Um, and even to the point where when Grandma would go up with Aunt Wilder, she would take care of Grandma too. So give all adoration to my aunt um, and to my grandmother uh, for who they were and, you know, in raising me to see what's right. Um, you learn as time goes that we only make life difficult for ourselves based on the choices 
and what we allow ourselves to entertain. I admire the simplicity that Grandma mastered in her life. Uh, like I said, letting go of worldly restraints that keep you from what's most important, uh, making it to the kingdom of heaven, and taking care of your family. You know, I remember one time bringing Grandma, I, I drove her here. Uh, this was while she was in her stages of dementia. And, you know, Grandma would point to a lot of things. What's that? What's this over there? What is that guy doing? And you'd be surprised how good her sight was. Um, not to say the least her hearing was and all that. But, <laughs> um, you know, one day we were just driving here, and I just peeked over, and I just saw her just looking up into the sky. I'm like, Grandma, what are you looking at? Like, she's just looking. And she said, I'm just looking at the clouds. I said, why are you looking at the clouds? I want to know which one I'm going to be on when I go to heaven. <laughs> and it, you know, it kind of, inside I was crying because I knew, you know, Grandma was at that age, but at the same time, I knew that she really believed that. And she made, she's made all of us believers uh, in God, you know, so. I'm truly going to miss my sugar plum is what we used to call each other. Um, and I thank you guys. Love you, Grandma. Thank you. We're going to hear from her son. Um, first, we're going to have um, Philip Francis to come up, and then Paul, you will follow after Philip, and then Mark Caregiver. Family is the people in your life who want you in theirs, the ones who accept you, the ones who accept you for who you are, love you no matter what, and would do anything to see you smile. My family, my friends, church members, loved ones. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for being here and supporting my mother's passing. Um, I'm going to try to get through this difficult time. It will be a struggle. asked to speak I know that's my obligation so um, I tried to think of something to write or some form of a structure so I'm gonna try to stick the script it's not gonna be easy um, it's not easy as the elder said um, I'm remote, meaning I'm not here to share the day-to-day -day of the last few years of my mother, and uh, it was a sacrifice for me. You know, I just retired from the military, and um, I just completed 34 years in the military. Um, I retired one year ago. I joined the Army on my father's birthday, and I recall that my mother, when I told her that I was going to sign up to join the military, the look on her face, how scared she was for me, you know, she immediately thought tragedy. You know. But uh, 
I made the sacrifice. And once again, I became remote from my family. Um, my mother knew a lot about sacrifice. She sacrificed to make us who we are today. Speaking of sacrifice, my brother Mark, he just retired not too long ago. And uh, sacrifice is something that our family knows a lot about. There are many stories that I can add to complement that word as it applies to my family. Um, my mother stayed alive to see me one more time. Um, right after Christmas, I came down. I know her time was getting dim. Her health was failing her. And um, I needed to see mom. And I got down here in time to spend New Year's and celebrate my birthday and one year sacrificed, retired from the military. She sacrificed her pain to stick around to celebrate that with me. I'm grateful. So, I went home back to South Carolina where I presently reside feeling that there was a great accomplishment in being able to at least lay my eyes upon her one more time. And no sooner that I got back, what, which was inevitable, I had to turn around and come back. So I didn't get to have that last conversation with her. So at this time, I would like to invite everybody in here to share an intimate moment in poem of a last conversation with my mother. It's going to be rough. God saw you getting tired, and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come to me. With tearful eyes, we watched you and saw you pass away. And although we loved you dearly, we could not make you stay. Golden heart stopped beating. Hardworking hands at rest. God broke our hearts to prove to us he only takes the best. So in reply, at that conversation, my mother would say to me, weep not for me, though I have gone into the gentle night. Grieve if you will, but not for long upon my soul's sweet flight. I'm at peace. My soul is at rest. There's no need for tears. For with your love, I was so blessed for all those many years. There is no pain. I suffer not. The fear is now all gone. Put now these things out of your thoughts. In your memory I live on. 
Remember not my fight for breath. Remember not my strife. Please do not dwell upon my death, but celebrate my life. Thank you for sharing this intimate moment with me. I would like to believe that that's the last conversation that I would share with my mother. And that's what I will remember to celebrate her life. Thank you. Good morning, family and friends. God is good all the time. I can truly say that we've been blessed. I'm going to give you a brief account of my life with my mother. Um, but first I want to say that she went through a difficult time in her early childhood where when she wanted to become a nurse and she was working vocationally to become an LPN, that she contracted in St. Thomas tuberculosis. And this was at a time when there was no cure. And a lot of people were dropping like flies in the 40s and 50s, okay? Uh, I am totally indebted to my Uncle Walter, who was her older brother, because if it were not for him in getting her over from St. Justatius to the United States, uh, and the doctor that he worked for, who put in a recommendation to a doctor in upstate New York that was running a sanitarium and testing out different medications that might, uh, you know, um, be the cure, okay? My mother went upstate in a very exclusive place that, uh, you know, if you didn't have the money, you couldn't really go. God found a way for my mom to be in that place and to be in the first testing uh, uh, of this drug that was the actual cure. She was in the first, bring it back a little bit. I'll lower my voice. She was in the first graduating class of people that were cured of tuberculosis, okay? They had to cut out a, 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 a lobe in her lung, okay? And this is all before she even met my father and had four, four boys. We had a very, very close church community at Brooklyn Temple, Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'd go to church in the morning. We'd stay after church. We would eat there, okay? We'd, we'd, uh, we'd hang out until MV started, okay? Sometimes my parents would leave us and go home, and we'd still be at the church until 10, 11 o'clock at night and catch buses home, all right? I mean... I'm talking eight, nine years old, 10 years old, all right? Um, and then we came to Florida after my brother had passed away. He got hit by a car right in front of our house. Um, his name was Michael, Michael Anthony Francis. And um, when we moved, we had to move. It happened right out in front of the place we were living. Okay, so change of, you know, location was necessary because it was very hard 
It was the first death that we ever experienced. I watched him get hit by the car. He was playing with me in the street, okay? So we get here, we come to Mount Olivet, okay? Uh, it wasn't a lot of kids, it wasn't a lot of, it was a lot of older people back in 1969. And uh, no transportation for young people, like Brother Sterling was saying. It was like putting on the brakes. So we really didn't like here, okay? Uh, but my father decided to move back to New York after we'd been here for a year. And um, when we moved back, I was so happy. And I was in public school. And I did my sophomore year. And at the end of that year, my mother came to me, you know, uh, <laughs> and she said to me, Paul, would you like to go to an Adventist Academy? And I didn't want to disappoint my mom. And I told her, yeah, sure, you know? I mean, so I go to this um, academy uh, it was called Pioneer Valley Academy. It was predominantly white. And uh, my, I, I can say impressionably, okay, uh, my concept of Seventh-day Adventism and whatnot was shot because of all of the racism that I had encountered in that school. So. I left out of there and I came back to public school down here. And, um, you know, my mom, when she put me through school there, it was like she wanted me to go and it was gonna be a financial burden on us as a family. And my father just moved back down to Florida. My mom stayed with my Aunt Millie up in New York and, and worked to put me through that school. My mom has been a very selfless, gentle, humble human being, you know, and she's lived her life to, to, uh, to save her children, okay, and to witness to others. That's, that's my mom in a nutshell. There's a song called That's the Way of the World by Earth, Wind, and Fire. And in one of the verses, it says that a child is born with a heart of gold, but the way of the world makes their heart grow cold. Well, I'm here to tell you today, my mom's heart was warm and soft, okay? And that's because she wasn't going with the way of the world. She was going with the way of the Lord. And as they say, you know, in the Bible, the, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. I honestly believe that my mother has a pole position, okay, up front. Because she always gave. She always gave. She would rather buy you a pair of shoes and walk around barefoot. That's the kind of mother I have. In her last few hours, I spent with her. I, I, Friday nights, I would always, uh, you know, I would put on hymns, you know, traditional hymns on Friday night, and we'd sing them together. This is before she uh, came totally, you know, when she could walk and she was ambulatory. We'd do this every Friday night. She'd sleep in the bed with me, you know. Uh, we'd watch sermons uh, on Sabbath, one after the other things on that line, okay? Well, in her last couple of hours, uh, my brother Mark came to me and said, Paul, you need to go in and see mom. We all took a turn, okay, in spending some personal time with her. And I, uh, I went in and I put on my phone with a Bluetooth speaker, traditional hymns, and I was singing them with her, I'm hugging her, I'm putting my forehead on hers, 
tears dripping on her face, off of my face, off of my face, okay? I'm kissing her all over and I'm talking to her and singing. And I said to her, you know, mom, you know what's happening, right? And I said, I want you to pray to the Lord and ask him if it's possible to extend your life a little further. But if that's not gonna happen, if that's not his will, Mom, I want you to know that I know you're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven, and I promise you, I'm going to be there too. All of her, all of her life, all she wanted to do was save us, and I'm not going to let that go down in vain. That's for, God. That's for sure. I love my mom, and I feel like I've lost a rudder. I got robbed. I'm looking at the time, and uh, I, um, I'm conscious of, uh, of that, and I really would like for everybody to, to have a, an opportunity. Uh, so much was said. Uh, hope, I mean, <laughs> you guys have really warmed my heart today. And I hope when you see me, you see my mom, that you see a reflection. So uh, I'd like to say, when I think about foreshadowing, my first public speaking was done in front of a church in Brooklyn. And my mom had me practice and practice. Uh, it was actually a song but I'm not going to sing here today. <laughs> but it's, it's something I sang to her every Mother's Day. But just looking and foreshadowing, and I, it's on your program, where M is for the million things you gave me. O means only that you're growing old. T is for the tears you shed to save me. H is for your heart of pillars gold. E is for your eyes with love light shining. And R means right. You'll always be. Put them all together, they spell mother, a word that means the world to me. Um, I shared my mom with everybody. I was a daddy's boy. I was a latchkey kid. I came down here after my brother died, hated South Florida, couldn't wait to go back. I had, you know, my mom's 13 brothers and sisters. I come down here and my father's going to Miami Dade. I'm going to uh, Parkway, going to Laurel Hill Middle, going to Piper High School. All my cousins, I mean, most of my aunts and uncles had at least four kids. And I'm down here, and uh, I was peculiar as a um, African-Caribbean kid. It's real different back then. Um, but I have to look around, and, and I have to say some things because I have family here, and people who supported me you know, through time. I got a call today, I mean, not today, this week, from um, Stephen McIntosh, and even Nola. I mean, these are people that were early in the church, and he said something. He said, you know, your mom and your dad were here, and, you know, we could claim your mother 
and claim your father as our professor and as our nurse. And as they were sort of integrating and the culture is, you know, the, the dynamics were going on, um, to just hear that my mom and my dad had something to do with that. And to also have somebody call me and tell me that they're the head of a hospital today because of my mom's character and what she saw on a very foundational level. Um, it's just been an interesting transition. I have my family here, and I include that as my, my fraternity, my Zeta Phi family, and more specifically, my essential elements <laughs> and my hot ice. They supported me through my time. Um, I look across the room, I see Guy Wheeler and Bobby DeBones in the corner. That's my dad's seat, get up. <laughs> but I see you over there. <laughs> and I could just move all around the room and thank all these people. But my role here, everybody's talked about being a son, but being a caregiver. I've been transformed. I've been carved. And I found out that I'm not alone. My father died in 98. My universe shifted. Our family was splintered. My mother and my niece, on the same day my niece was in ICU, she died. My mother fell on the same day. And I had to go from one place to another place. And my life changed then. I was still working. And this was right before COVID. This is November 19th, 1919. I'm sorry, 2019. I still had to go to work. And a lot of people, and I know there are people in the room here today, that to come and celebrate with us today, you might have had to clean somebody up. Or you had to feed them. And you still had to show up. I was a daddy's boy. And I understand why my dad's the way that he was. My mother was so foundational. But in the last 10 months, the communication, the telepathy, the connection that I've had with her, It's hard, it's hard to explain. It's just something that you feel. And I would just, I would just hope that everybody could have and maximize a relationship with someone like that. I'm a man taking care of a woman. And with that, I decided to commit myself to a health and temperance sort of campaign in my mother's honor. So I say that, I mean, we don't have much time, but stay, stay tuned. Um, what I would like to do is continue to move forward and support entities. The system is broken. It's just my mom's internal fortitude and her desire to see her children know the Lord is why she's lasted as long as she did. People would come in and say, Mark, give your mom permission. Give her permission to go. I didn't have anything to do with it. She had love light in her eyes and she wasn't in pain. She had her own time. 
And honestly, I'm not selfish. It was very hard coming into the room wondering if she's still breathing for months, for months. So I just want to say that um, everybody said things and everybody knows. But as I look across the room, you have no idea. It's like cobwebs. I'm looking across the room at all the people that have been indirectly and directly impacted by my mom. And I want to say thank you. And I'm going to say thank you by reflecting my mother's love in my life ongoing. And it's my job to make sure that I get to see her again. I've got work to do. So I want to say thank you. Everybody that's here, I'll find the time to do that. But thank you very much. There will be um, on your program or contact me at a later date because I truly would like to work with entities that have people as myself who are still working. I'm at the age right now, I really thought I was alone, I'm not. You've got a mother, you've got a father, you've got a brother, you've got somebody who is aging or who is in the healthcare system. And I, you hear all of this and you see all this. My mom had advocates, some people don't. So I just ask you to join me in that campaign in my mom's honor Leah Francis Health and Temperance Fund. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the Blair and Francis family for affording me this opportunity, just a few moments, to share some words of comfort. Thank you, Pastor Bat and Elder Sterling, for allowing me to occupy this this desk just for a few moments. Family, there are, I bring you greetings on behalf of the Bethel SDA Church in Orlando, Florida, where we borrowed our dear Sister Leah Francis for a period whenever she would come to spend time with family and to visit. She would come to Bethel and one of my fondest memories of her is whenever I gave her a hug, I would always shake her up a little bit when I gave her that hug. And she looked at me and she said, you ain't my husband. <laughs> and no, ma'am, I'm not, but I need to just shake you up a little bit. <laughs> Family, there are no words that I can say from a human perspective at a time like this, because I am just as broken as you all are. And so I will briefly turn to the word of God where true comfort comes from. And I will read in your hearing very briefly from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll start with verse 13. The Bible says there, but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The Bible says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. We believe, family, by faith that our dear sister Francis is sleep in Jesus right now. And so that hope and that comfort is that when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, We'll see our dear sister again. I continue reading. The Bible says, For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You heard my dear sister sing a song this morning, and she sung so loud she didn't need a microphone. But when Jesus comes, family, there'll be a shout. 
with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that passage ends by saying, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And my last verse I'll leave with you, family. You've heard individuals talk and, and, and Paul just mentioned this, his covenant that he made with his mother to be there. I leave you with 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10. The Bible says, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. And so for everyone here in this room, all family members, all well wishers, all friends, our dear sister Frances, She's run her race. She's fought the good fight. She's finished her course. She's kept the faith. And so I would ask that all of us here in this room make our calling and our election sure. The word of God says, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. I leave you family. There'll be some rough days. There'll be some tough times. There'll be some grieving. There'll be some days where things just won't seem right because dear sister Frances is no longer here. But the Bible says, for yet in a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. God bless you. Good evening, family. I would believe that Brother Francis would say, it is well, it is well with my soul. When
I rise this afternoon to share with the family and those who have gathered here. It is at this moment that we come to share a word from the Lord. But before I do that, I want to encourage everyone to help me to thank those of Mount Olivet Church family who are here today to help with this service and especially uh, AV upstairs. They had some difficulty earlier today. The Lord worked it out. They kept at it. And I want to thank you so very much uh, for that. And I also want to thank the family, Paul, Mark, and Philip, others, especially for allowing me the, the opportunity to share in this capacity. I know that you have been sitting for a while, and I have been in this business long enough to know that your mind can only take in what your seat can absorb. <laughs> and so I'm going to move right on and share the, from the Word of God today. I know that there is, we are behind the schedule that was intended. But if you'll give me a few moments, I promise you I won't take too long. Will you give me a few moments? Uh, are you with me? Amen. Somebody said, take my time. Who said that? God bless you, my sister. I'll see you. I have some money for you afterwards. God bless you. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, come now and be with us today. Thank you for the life and legacy of Sister Frances. Grant your presence in the preaching of your word today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Just want to lift up once again, just for a few moments, the thought we know. We know. How many of you know that one plus one equals? Right? Y'all help me out now. I'll be I'm real short. I'll be real short if you help me out. If you don't, my sister right here going to get some money. <laughs> one plus one equals what? We also know that a green light means what? We know that a red light means? We know that a yellow light means? No, it doesn't. It means uh, keep on going. Uh, hurry up and get through that light. You know how it is. It means slow down and caution, but we know we go pedal to the metal. As clergy, we know that a late night, early morning call means something has happened. When things slow down on the job, and you were the last one hired. We know that a slip of paper is coming. And we know that when our son or daughter receives that 
envelope in the mail from that university where they have applied for school. And when they open it and there is a shriek of joy, we know they have been accepted into that prestigious school. We know these things. There are many things, however, that we do not know. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't know how things are going to take place next week. We make plans and we put them on paper. We, we, we are ready for those things to happen, but we do not know what tomorrow will bring. Right now, people are putting in position uh, for the run for the presidency of the United States of America, even though it's two years out. We don't know who will be the next president of the United States. Neither do we know how long our political leaders uh, will continue in their woeful activity. We don't know how long it will uh, take for our sons or, or daughters uh, to get it right. But what we do know, the Bible declares that a man is born of a woman and in a full day, few days full of trouble. And we know that trouble will come. Uh, everyone in this room, you've had some trouble uh, at some point in time in your life. You've had difficulty to come. You, you've had a, a, a scraped knee. You had a, an opportunity when you got up at late at night and tried to get to the refrigerator. You stomped that toe. And you know that trouble was coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to submit to you today that, that, that we don't know a lot of things, but, but we know uh, that uh, sin has come into the world. How do I know? Uh, because the Bible declares that, well, that the wages of sin is death. Everybody has to go this way, ladies and gentlemen. May I submit to you that, uh, that we all have sinned. But, but the, the, the Bible says uh, that the gift of God, that gift of grace, is something that comes to us through Jesus Christ. And, and that is eternal life. Somebody ought to help me let you know today that when you have Jesus, uh, you may go down in the uh, sleep of death, uh, but you have eternal life in the getting up morning. We know, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, those who receive Jesus by faith as Savior and Lord, uh, uh, that they have uh, uh, their, 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 their gift of eternal life waiting on them. Ladies and gentlemen, we know, we know that those who believe in Christ Jesus, even though we live in a world that is worn out, they are new creations. I'm glad to let you know this morning that from what I have heard and what I observed from Mother Frances, even though I was there in her later waning days and months, I want you to know that what we have known about her has revealed that she believed in Jesus Christ. She received him and her life was changed. You see, uh, Christianity is something that happens on the inside and, and shows up on the outside. Come on, say amen. Uh, Christianity is something that helps us to understand that, that God is after our character, uh, not uh, uh, our Corvettes. He wants us to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that, that, that we know that the Bible teaches us uh, that God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, God stepped out on nothing and, and he created everything uh, for our enjoyment on this earth. Uh, I want you to know that God created these things uh, and Jesus was born of a woman. Uh, he lived among men. Matter of fact, the word of God tells me uh, that he was made flesh and he walked 
walked among us and he talked like us and he walked like us and then he was unlike us in the sense that he came from glory uh, down to us so that he could walk among us so that he can heal the brokenhearted so that he can lift up those who have bowed down heads I want to let you know today uh, family uh, that God is still in the business uh, of healing uh, broken hearts he's still in the business uh, of helping you know uh, that even though you go through hard times he's still with you today he healed the sick Jesus he raised the dead Jesus himself he died on that blood sock cross uh, called Calvary he died because if he didn't die we would die eternally without any hope of a resurrection but I'm here to let you know that we know that Jesus uh, he died uh, um, but he got up that third day morning with all power somebody help me now with all what power in his hands uh, while we may understand that grief is the price we pay for love uh, I want you to know ladies and gentlemen uh, that the word declares uh, that even though you may cry a tear you may drop a tear you may sob a bit uh, when everybody else is gone family a uh, Paul when nobody else is around a, a family when everybody has gone back to their their locales and their uh, their jobs when you're there all alone please hear me today uh, that the Holy Ghost will come uh, and be by your side he'll be with you he won't let you be alone uh, he'll have a, a bottle for every tear uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know uh, that the, it, when that bottle uh, uh, fills up, uh, he, uh, you empty it out, he has another bottle for your tears because I am glad to let you know that death uh, of our dearest loved ones may take them away physically, uh, but we know that they're in our hearts because the Bible teaches us, friends of mine, uh, that uh, we don't have to sorrow uh, like those who have no hope, but we know uh, that we when we have hope in Jesus that uh, we have hope that one day uh, we'll see a uh, mother Francis again uh, one day we know that we will have an uh, opportunity uh, to walk the streets of gold uh, uh, when someone dies and leaves us it hurts like the Dickens uh, it hurts uh, to the very core uh, but I want you to know today friends of mine uh, uh, that the Lord himself uh, shall come one day uh, with the trumpet sound uh, and the dead in Christ will get up first uh, they'll be like popcorn uh, uh, roasting on an open fire uh, popping up everywhere or if you don't like the popcorn illustration uh, they'll be like pop tarts uh, coming up out of that toaster ladies and gentlemen I want you to know that God is coming back real soon and he knows uh, all about our trouble a uh, time will come a uh, time will come when the morning breaks eternal uh, bright and fair come on now Bible students uh, we know uh, it will be a glad morning uh, when Jesus returns it's going to be a glad morning I say uh, when Jesus comes uh, uh, we're going to wake up uh, when he comes he's going to wake up all the sleeping saints uh, who went down uh, after all those trouble after all of those sicknesses after all of their trials and tribulations they went down into the grave but lo and behold the bible says that when Jesus comes uh, he's going to give all the saints those who were sleeping he's going to give them their seat assignment Gonna give them their seat assignment on flight 777 on the way to glory land. I can't get a witness here. All the saints uh, will fly away into that land uh, where joy will never end. Uh, there will be the, on the face of Jesus. We'll see him all oh, face to face. Oh, blissful moment. It's gonna be a wonderful time when we see Jesus. We know. That when Jesus comes, all of the tears that flow today, he's going to dry those tears. Friends of mine, now I want you to understand, 
Paul, I want you to know, Mark and Philip, you knew Mother Frances as a good mother, a caring person. You all knew her better than anybody else here. You know that she was a nurse. You know uh, that she uh, was a good mother. You know that she uh, uh, cared for individuals uh, like you and others. She cared for the church. She cared for the community. She cared for those who were sick. But I want you to know now today uh, that even though mother knew all of these things and, and cared for these things, as you have indicated today, that she just wants her boys to live again. To see him. See Jesus when he comes. She wants her boys to love on each other even now. She wants her boys to get along with each other right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I've been around long enough to understand that challenges come and are dictated and, and seen at weddings and funerals. But today you have the opportunity uh, to be at, at peace with one another and understand one another. Let each other grieve in their own way. But don't let them hurt themselves, uh, but let them grieve. Uh, can I get a witness, friends? We must understand that she wanted them, she wants you gentlemen uh, uh, to uh, be able to see Jesus when he comes. So that when he comes, you'll be able to sing and join that hymn. Uh, uh, let us labor for the master from the dawn uh, to the setting of the sun. Uh, let's uh, talk of all his wonders, love and care. And uh, then when life is over and our work on earth is done and when the roll is called up yonder. When the what? When the roll is called up yonder. It's like when, when well, I don't know if they still do it now. It's some, Teachers, uh, Sister Greg uh, Williams, do y'all still call Roe at school today? Y'all still call Roe? Well, that's good because I'm getting ready to give an illustration now. We, see, this is what God wants. And this is what Mother Frances wants. Uh, uh, she wanted. And this is what the Lord wants. To do. You see, uh, when your name is called up yonder, God wants you to be able to Say, present. Yes. See, can you just imagine in the schoolhouse of glory uh, and Jesus uh, walks into the classroom. Uh, the PA system has, uh, we have sung uh, the Pledge of Allegiance uh, uh, to the Bible flag. Uh, we have said the allegiance to Christ and to God. And now, and now at the, the, we're in the class and Jesus walks in. He looks at the class and he, call, he looks at the role and he begins to call the role. And he says, uh, he says, Sterling. She said, here, thank you. Uh, she, he said, Holmes. Here. Uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, Great Williams. Here. Uh, he, he said, he said, Batten. Does he say, Paul, Francis? I hope that Paul will say, here. Uh, I pray uh, that Philip will say, here. I pray that Mark will say, here. I pray that everybody in here will say, I pray that we all, uh, when we all get to heaven, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll be able uh, to answer the call uh, for Jesus himself. Uh, he's going to come and he's going to call roll. And when the roll is called up yonder, I pray that we'll know that we will be there. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God encourage you to know that when the roll is called up yonder, we'll be there. Family, continue to encourage one another. Continue to love each other. 
be there for one another. And don't, don't let any animosities, any challenges in the past keep you from loving each other and being there for one another. May the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit be with you and encourage you is my prayer. Thank you for this time. And please remember that when the role is called the beyonder, somebody say, I'm here, Lord. God bless you. A precious one from us has gone. A voice we love is still. A space is vacant in our homes, which never can be refilled. We, the management and staff of the James C. Board Friend Home, on behalf of the Francis family, the family would like that we take this opportunity to first off thank you, the many friends from turning away from your daily walks of life to come out and be with this family when they need you the most. Your letters, your cards, I know your floral tributes would not be acknowledged at this time, but they will be honored when time presents itself more opportune. You'll be each thanked in a more personal manner. At this time, we want to have a special presentation to the sons. We're going to ask that y'all come forth at this time. Let's give them a round of applause as they come forth. Amen. Amen. The claps and the applause of everyone simply say that we love you guys and that we're praying for you guys in the days and the weeks and the months to come. And we just want to present this tapestry and loving memory of your mom and our thoughts and prayers are this. In the days and the weeks, the months to come, when you find yourself feeling sad, once you pull out your Bible and read it, and the word is going to give you strength. But on the nights that you get cold, take this tapestry of mom and wrap it around you. And our prayers is that our memories will forever keep you warm. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless. This time, we're going to prepare for the final glimpse.
going to encourage you, please, to view and keep going, please. If you wouldn't mind, please. Thank you so kindly. We ask that you would review and keep going. Thank you so kindly. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, if you could just continue, come forward, please. Thank you so much. that you would, the funeral director, he is escorting uh, the family side now, starting from the back. Please follow his instructions, please. Thank you. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you.
God, sing with me, oh great is our God, always sing a great, oh great is our God. Please remember that the repass is at the L.A. Lee YMCA on Sistrunk 14. O nine six strong. It is in this on this card here in your hands. God bless you. For those who are the pallbearers, could you please come closer? Thank you. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when the trumpet shall sound, Christ shall come and so shall put on.